All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College, and I'll be going over the PowerPoint presentations from Murox ASP.NET 4.6 with C Sharp 2015 6th edition, Chapter 17 How to Use Object Data Sources with ADO.NET. And I am absolutely positive that this particular set of videos will take at least two or three, if not more, videos. All right, same with Chapter 18, as I discussed previously. So we're talking about how to use object data sources with EDO.net. Our objectives, our applied objectives, are to be able to use object data sources to develop what are referred to as three-layer ASP.NET database applications. Create a data access class. All right, remember one thing when you create code with classes, and that is class code does not have a GUI. It's just, uh, it, it just has business rules or logic in it. All right, these data access classes can be used with, object data, with an object data source. <clears throat> Use business objects with object data sources. Our knowledge objectives in general terms describe how three-layer applications work in ASP.NET. Describe the two main benefits of using object data sources. In general terms, describe what an SQL connection, SQL command, and SQL data reader, what each is and what they do. <clears throat> Explain the concept of reflection, what it is and how it's used with object data sources. Describe the way business objects are used with object data sources, and in general terms, Describe how to use paging and sorting with object data sources. So the first thing that's discussed in here is three-layer or a three-layer application. So I'm going to start this in a little different way, and that is by typing in here three-layer application. Fact here is three-layer application ASP.NET. And I was going to see if we had anything that was a good explanation. The content here is outdated. Well, that isn't good. All right, so in this example, and I just grabbed this from geekswithblogs.net, a simple three-tier layers application in ASP.NET. And what I like here is they're showing each of the layers. There we go. So we've got a presentation layer. As it says, it contains the UI or user interface elements of the site and includes all the logic that manages the interaction between the visitor and the client's business. We then have the business tier, which receives the requests from the presentation tier and returns a result to the presentation tier depending on the business logic it contains. Finally, we have the data tier. And the data tier is responsible for storing the application's data and sending it to the business tier when requested. Well, the main reason that I wanted to show you this is it is similar in nature to what we'll be talking about in Chapter 25, and that is model view controller architecture, all right? And in a model view controller architecture, the model is how you basically, uh, the association you have with the data, all right? So the model is similar to the data tier here. The view is the HTML that gets returned to the user, so that's similar to the presentation tier. And the controller is the, the traffic cop, so to speak, between the model and the view. All right, and that's like the business tier that you see here. So that's why I wanted to show you this. And again, I'm not saying this is any better or any worse than anything else that you could have found. I don't know if I, if I were to go into... Google Images 
and I typed in three layer architecture in ASP.NET. All right, they're, they're all going to look similar. This is probably from that same document that we just looked at. Here's something with a little more description to it. So again, the presentation tier at the top level, it's the user interface. The main function of the interface is to translate tasks and results to do the work so that the work that's done behind the scenes, the end product can be shown to the end user. We've got the logic tier that is the coordinator or again, kind of the traffic cop between the presentation tier and the data tier. As it says here, it processes the commands, it makes logical decisions and evaluations, and it performs calculations as necessary. The key thing is that last sentence there. It moves and processes data between the presentation and data tiers. All right. And then finally, we've got the data tier, where as it says, here the information is stored and retrieved from a database or a file system. And let's be real here, it's almost always going to be some form of a database. The information is then passed back to the logic tier for processing and eventually back to the user. You have no guarantee that what the, that the database that you're going to be using is going to be um, SQL Server. It, it very well could be. But also, if you're a company that, that has to interface with a lot of other companies, you may be SQL Server and they may be Oracle, or they may be MySQL, which is an Oracle product, or they may be DB2 or something else. They may not even use a database. Typically doesn't happen, but it's not impossible that something like that could happen. All right, so this is how the book describes this three-layer architecture. I, there's nothing wrong with their description, but I just, I, you know, since this is so paramount to what the chapter is about, I wanted to give you as much of this as I could. So again, the presentation layer on the top is the A, are the ASP pages that manage the appearance of the application. As mentioned there, they can include bound data controls and object data controls that bind the data controls to the data. The middle tier is the date, contains the data access classes that manage the data access for the application. They can also contain business objects that represent business entities such as customers, products, or employees that implement the business rules. What are business rules? They are literally that. The business rules, for example, for Rankin Technical College say that if you want to be a student here, first you have to sign up for classes, then you have to be, you know, you have to register, and then you have to be accepted. Once you're accepted, you have to pay for classes. All right, to be successful here, you also have to both show up for classes and follow the codes that are set by Rankin. Those are our business rules. Then you've got the database layer, which consists of the database and the data for the application. The SQL statements that do the data access can be saved in stored procedures. All right, but they don't have to be. They're off time stored in data access classes. What I do want to mention here is this is similar in nature to what we'll see in Chapter 25 for Model View Controller, but it is not identical. So an object data source is going to be used here. It'll be implemented and it'll allow for data binding within this three-tier architecture. Okay, An object data source is similar to an SQL data source, but instead of directly accessing a database, it gets its data through data access classes. What's nice about that is that you're able to write code that basically will manipulate your database for you. So it's, it's much easier, let's put it this way, it can be much more intuitive for the person who is, or persons 
who are running your application. All right, so again, here's the three layers. Leave that up there for a second. All right, so to code the data access classes that you need to use with data sources and this three-layer architecture, you can use ADO.NET. And again, ADO is an acronym that stands for Active X Data Objects. So what's shown in the next several slides are the ADO.NET classes and members used by applications in this chapter. These are the ones you'll use most often, kind of the 80-20 rule. It's the 20% you'll use 80% of the time. Before you can access the database, you have to create a connection object. That's what you see here first. This connection object defines the connection to the database. On the constructor for this object, you can include the connection string. We've looked at that connection string earlier. It includes information such as the name of the database, the name of the server. It might have authentication information such as a user ID and a password. The open method is used to open the database connection. The close method is used to close the database connection. Typically, you will leave the connection open only while you're either retrieving data or updating data. It's not like you know, in, in, in our examples, it's not going to matter that much because we're each going to be using our own copy of, da of a database. But in the, quote, real world, unquote, you'll constantly be opening and closing connections as needed because you may have literally thousands, millions, or more people trying to access the same database at the same time. Now, when you want to execute, when you want to execute an SQL statement against an SQL server database, you create one of these command objects. All right, these command objects can accept a string that contains an SQL statement to be executed and an SQL connection object. That's what's shown on the top there. When you execute a command object, you use two execute methods. For example, if, you're in, if you are executing a select statement, you use an execute reader. All right, the reason that the execute reader is used here is the execute reader does not return a value. It is meant to just show information. On the other hand, If you want to execute an insert, update, or delete statement, you use the execute non-query method. The reason for that is the execute non-query method does return an integer value that shows the number of rows inserted, updated, or deleted. For example, if you delete a single row and you run the execute non-query, it should return a 1. To work with the data reader that's returned by the execute reader of a command object, you use the members of the SQL data reader class. <clears throat> so the connection object is required to establish the connection to the database. A command object is used to execute an SQL command against an SQL server database and an SQL data reader provides read-only, forward-only database access. All right? Again, I'm, I'm being very literal, and I'm going over the stuff that is actually shown in the book, but to me, this is unbelievably important to go over this stuff. All right? This is tying it all together. This is the way that most complex applications that access databases are going to be written. All right. So what's shown here are the basics of working with the object data source. This image 
image rather shows how an object data source control that's bound to a drop down data list would appear would appear in the web forms designer previously we saw sql data source sql data source 1 but this is an object data source all right this code example that you see right here shows the ASPX code for the drop-down list and the object data source that it's bound to. In the example here, you can see that the drop-down list is bound to the object data source using that data source ID. We've talked about that many times before. You can also see that the code for the object data source control has just two properties besides the required ID and the run end. Those are the type name property, which provides the name of the data access class that you're going to use, in this case, product DB, and the select method, which provides the name of the method within the class used to retrieve the data, in this case, get all categories. This code example, which again is shown on page 603, shows the get all category method of the product DB class. This uses hopefully fairly straightforward code to retrieve the category rows from the categories table and return a data reader object that is going to hold all of our information, the category ID the, and the long name which will be ordered by long name. So we're setting up a string that's going to hold our values. We're creating our command object. We're opening the command object. We're telling it to run. All right. And again, we're using an execute reader instead of an execute non-query because it's a select statement. And then we're returning that data reader. You may or may not have noticed that what's at the top here, all right, this is a C-sharp attribute that, that identifies it as a select method for a data access class. Okay, we'll talk about these a little bit later on in the chapter. So the object data source control specifies the name of the data access class and the methods that we're going to use to select, update, delete, and insert data. The basic properties include type name, which is the name of the data access class, select method, which is the name of the method to retrieve but not change data, update, which is the name of the method to update data, delete, which is the name of the method to delete data, insert, which is the method that inserts data, data object type name, which is the name of a class that provides properties used to pass parameter values and conflict detection. We've seen that earlier in other chapters to specify how concurrency conflicts will be detected and basically how we're going to work with them. Compare all values uses optimistic concurrency checking and overwrite values, which is the default. It does no concurrency checking and I believe that's a last in wins type of, type of setup. As far as configuring the object data source control, and this is pages 604 and 605 in the text, the first dialog box that comes up here, the one that you see here, lets you choose the business object that will be associated with the object data source. The selection you make here will be specified in the type name property of the object data source control. The drop down list here lists all of the classes that are available in the models folder. You might need to build the solution before this works correctly. When you select a data access class and you click next, then the second one here comes up. This should look familiar to you. All right, this is what you, you were going to use if you want to retrieve data for an object data source. The one you select is specified in the selected method property. So you can select any of these here, meaning that you can select, select, update, insert, or delete. 
if you choose the select method that requires parameters, the define parameters step allows you to specify the source for each required parameter. All right. As far as working with bound controls, and this is on the bottom of page 604 in the text, as the author says right here, although you can bind a control such as a grid view control to an object data source, you can't always use the designer to select individual fields like you can with an SQL data source. That's because the fields are defined in the data access class. If that confuses you, look at it this way. That rather than working with individual data items, also known as simple data items or elementary data items, you're working more with a data structure. You're working with a collection of data items. To avoid having to enter the name of all these fields, you can code the select method so it returns strongly, a strongly typed collection, which we'll talk about later. All right, let me check my time. I'm at 21 minutes, so I'm going to stop right here. And then in the next set of, or the next video, I'm going to talk about the product list application that begins on page 606.